All right, here's where we left off in the last slide. Now we'll continue on. <clears throat> so another reason that individuals join an interest group are is for solidarity. Uh, there, for some people, there's just a sense of pleasure and companionship that comes from that. Uh, for other people, there's a sense of status. Uh, you see the people sitting around here, this uh, upper left, um, uh, very uh, fine interest group as far as their their uh, physical surroundings. A uh, little prestigious to sit there and discuss issues, and some people just they they just thrive on that. Other people, other interest groups are less formal, um, but still you can see there's a sense of uh, camaraderie and companionship that's going on there. Here's the American American Medical Association down here in the lower left. Um, major uh, meeting of delegates there um, gives them a sense of uh, pleasure and status as well. So that's one of the reasons that individuals join the interest group. Another reason, um, more altruistic reason that people join interest groups is for purposive incentives. They uh, There's an appeal to the state of goal of the interest group. So you see the first on the left, the National Organization for Women. Uh, many, many women have joined that because they, they want to achieve the goals for which the interest group was established. You have the FLCI over here, American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations that have joined together, creating the AFL, AFL-CIO, uh, very powerful interest group across the United States. Um, so people join interest groups um, for, the, for the appeal of the stated goals. When you're, um, when you're required to join an interest group for your job, uh, it's going to be something like the AFL, AFL-CIO. Uh, that seeks to benefit the industry that you're part of. All right. In addition to interest groups, there also there is also something known as a public interest lobby. A public interest lobby is an organization that, if the principal benefit, if if the benefits are obtain, obtained, the that the organization seeks, and they will principally benefit non-members, then the interest group is referred to as a public interest lobby. Um, because everybody benefits whether or not they are a member of the group themselves. So one of the best example of public interest lobby is Ralph Nader's organization. Um, he founded this watchdog group to protect citizens uh, for consumer uh, safety. He published a book back in 1965, I believe it was, um, criticized, critical of the auto industry f for the safety record of their automobiles called unsafe at any speed and it was so popular um, that um, an organization formed around it um, and uh, he's run for president um, he's, he's one of the best examples of of an individual who uh, reached out and did something for the public good not necessarily for his own private good um, and that's that's what public interest lobbies do. So certainly all altru true altruistic organizations. Um, <clears throat> I want to I want to talk to you about the case of Daniel Aaron Scholzman. This is an at uh, at this point we're going off the reasons why people join interest groups and we're moving on to a new topic. So um, let me read this to you. One day Daniel Aaron Scholzman of Massachusetts joined eight interest groups: four liberal and four conservative. Over the next 18 months, he received 248 pieces of mail, weighing a total of 18 pounds. It included were 135 separate appeals for money. Of the total, 63 pieces of mail were from organizations that he had not joined, but that had apparently had bought or borrowed mailing lists from organizations that he had joined. The conservative org organizations allowed their mailing list to be used by other conservative conservatives, the liberal organizations by other liberals. For example, by joining. The National Conservation Caucus, he found himself on the mailing list of Young young Americans for Freedom, the Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, the National Tax Limitation Committee, the Senator Orrin Hatch Election Committee. By joining Common Cause, he found himself on the mailing list of the NAACP, the League of Women Voters, the National Organization for Women, the Campaign to Save the Massachusetts Bottle Bill, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. But it didn't do any of these organizations much good. Daniel Schulzman was only four months old. His mother, Professor K. Schulzman, a political scientist at Boston College, had enrolled him just to find out who shares mailing lists. So here's the point. 
here's the point of that little um, snippet there. Um, when you join an interest group, what you're going to find is you're going to find that all of a sudden you start getting uh, mailings or, or uh, to, to these days internet uh, uh, mails from organizations that you didn't join soliciting for you to join them or to donate money because the reality is interest groups share or sell their mailing list so on the test when I ask you what does the case of Daniel Aaron Schultzman represent that's what it represents um, or illustrates that interest groups share or sell their mailing list what are the what is the power what is the power of an interest group um, the more money that an interest group has the more the, the greater power it gives them to attempt to influence legislation but just because they have money and just because they attempt to influ uh, influence legislation does not mean they are successful um, it used to be when interest groups could donate as much as they want to a candidate that was more uh, likely to happen but these days most interest groups give very little to any one candidate the average is around two hundred fifty dollars that an interest group gives to any particular candidate what the what the donation does is it opens doors for them so when they want to speak to a member of a legislature they can say hey uh, we donated to you um, this year and just wanted to share con some concerns with you uh, but the more money that interest group has um, it gives them that organization to be able to attempt to influence legislation um, again with with highlighting it does not necessarily mean it happens um, one of the reasons it doesn't happen is because interest groups themselves are divided you have business interest groups that seek protection for um, products that are made within the United States versus those who desire open markets so you've got two two uh, types of interest group both who, of which are diametrically opposed to the other and so both can't get protection so what what happens is there tends to be a balance um, and, it also, and it also matters who's in Congress and, and uh, also who's in the White House um, but the best measure of an interest group strength is its organizational skill the example we gave you with the um, the NRA about trying to monitor the legislation from all 50 states and the national government and major city uh, legislatures and city councils um, bringing out legislation that would affect a right to own a gun if you can if you do not have the organizational skill to monitor this you're never as an or as an interest group can have uh, the strength you need to make any lasting impact or protect the rights of those uh, interests of, of, of who you serve the most effective commodity um, that alleged excuse me that an interest group has to influence a legislator is information um, legislators are not experts on every area and so they depend on their fellow legislators who serve on certain committees in Congress or in, in uh, a state legislature who are more the experts to inform them but they also rely on interest groups to inform them as to what is going on um, in, a, in an industry and what is what is what is best for that industry versus what will hurt that industry um, interest groups do not lie to the legislature because if they do they realize um, that they'll never trust them in the future and and won't listen to anything they say so they they tell them what's going on uh, there certainly might be a slant um, but the legislatures understand this um, and so this is a uh, vital um, need served by interest group for legislators the key target of a lobbyist is the undecided leg legislature the, the the interest group knows that they're not going to be able to to convince a, a liberal um, tree hugger to all of a sudden vote to cut down the rainforest that's not going to happen so what they're going to do is they're going to target target that undecided legislator um, to see if they can influence him or her to vote the way that that the interest group wants now negative pressure usually does not work there is an exception to this the LCVs um, they have this thing they call the dirty dozen the dirty dozen was a movie back in the 60s or so 60s late 60s early 70s about these 12 rough tough mean guys that save the world um, and so what the LCV has done is they have taken this 
and they have turned it into um, a, a, a way to list the 12 worst uh, legislators across the nation for protecting the vir environment. And they, they put this on their dirty dozen list. And it hurts. It hurts if you get put on this dirty dozen list. Um, there, will, there are people who will not vote for you because you get put on this dirty dozen list. So that is one exception to the rule that negative pressure um, from a uh, interest group or a lobbyist uh, does not work. That is one exception. All right, there it is, interest groups. I hope this was helpful. And uh, know this, and you'll be fine for the test.